So let's focus on that battle a little bit more. The ironic thing is how I ended it. The last increment. Is that everything the sin nature ever wanted, you get. Because it's real important to prove that this battle is foundational, is key in the angelic conflict, and is doctrinal. Okay. How do we know that that statement of the irony being that everything the sin nature ever wanted is what God actually gives you? And that that's the real battle of your life. Now maybe in your case it's not the most difficult. But it's definitely the real battle in any event. How do we know that's true? I mean, you know, don't believe it because Brainout says it. Okay. But believe it because Bible says it. Right? Okay. Bible starts talking about that. Immediately. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Which God? Jesus Christ. As God. How do we know that? Isaiah 45. Verses 18 and 19. Where he says, I, first person, did not create it. Tohu wabohu. Tohu wabohu are the Hebrew words in Genesis 1 2. Which then says, and it became, the earth became Tohu wabohu. Now, how do we know it means became? Because there's an adversative, what they call today Vav, that should be called Wow. W A W. That was the older pronunciation for it. That was what is in the Hebrew. And you know that because it would have to be adversative as a contrast. Because first of all, it's tr translated in the Greek with the adversative da, which always means contrast. Okay? Often mild contrast, but still contrast. Genesis 1 1. If God created the heavens and the earth, God did it. So it was perfect. God did it, so it was done. Those are two things that have to be said. God did it, it's done. I mean, the whole rest of the chapter is saying the same thing. God did it, it's done. God did it, it's perfect. So then what happened in Genesis 1 2? Well, Isaiah 45, verses 18 and 19, tell you something happened also. So you got Genesis 1, 2, and you got Isaiah 45, 18 and 19, because it's the express refusal that Genesis 1, 2 was something God created. So all of those stupid people who don't pay attention to Bible, who say that the earth is only 6,000 years old, and all that other claptrap, they're lying or sloven about the world, the word of God. Because Jesus Christ himself, the only talking member of the Godhead, pretty much all the theologians understand that. With the one who's talking and calling himself God is not Father but Christ. They call it a theophany. He's the one in Isaiah 45, 18 and 19, who says, I did not create it that way. So throw out all your King James only people. Throw out all the people who said, well, the world was literally created in six days. Which is throwing out most of the Jews too who ought to know better. He created it. Bereshit bara Elohim. Elohim. Okay? Genesis 1 1. And then Genesis 1 2, something else happened that he did not create. Isaiah 45, verses 18 and 19. I didn't create it that way. I didn't create Tohu Abohu. Tohu Abohu is in Genesis 1 2. 
So it became something it was not. So God is telling you immediately, okay, that what he does is perfect. And what you do or what creatures do messes it up. That's where your battle starts. It's telling you about the battle from the very beginning. And what happened? Well, he told you in Isaiah 45, 7, who was behind the Tohu Wabohu. What does it say? I, God, created everything. And then in the English, it's again mistranslated, just like in Genesis 1, 2, is mistranslated. In Isaiah 45, 7, it says, I created the evil one. The Hebrew there is ra'eh. It's an adjective, but it's used as a substantive, which is true in a lot of languages. When you just use an adjective, what, like for example, if I said to you, you're good. Good is an adjective. But I'm using it like a noun, a.k.a. substantive. So when it says, I, create, I God, created evil, that's an adjective being used as a noun, so it means the evil one, a.k.a. Satan. Well, it's Satan who trashed up the earth. Genesis 1-2. The earth became chaos and wasteland. Tohu wa bohu. Chaos, tohu, and wasteland. Wa is and, bohu. Wasteland. Chaos and wasteland. And God didn't create chaos. Who did? Take a guess. There's your battle. Right there from the beginning. Now why would Satan rebel? Well, we're told. Isaiah 14, starting at verse 12. Ezekiel 28, and I forget where that one starts. It's all, you were the sun, the morning star. Satan's original title was Helel ben Shachar, son of the morning. We call it the planet Venus, or we call it the morning star. Because it's what you see in the morning when you're in Israel and you get up in the morning. That's one of the planets you can see. We call it Venus today. They called it Chelel ben Shachar after Satan's name because he was the, like, how do you want to call it? If you wanted to go and visit Jesus Christ in his, what do you want to call it, his displaying himself as an angel, then you had to go through Satan to get an appointment. I mean, that's sort of simplifying it over much, but that's basically it. He was the guardian of the throne. And that's what Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are telling you. You know, it starts off as ostensibly talking to the king of Tyre. But it's really talking to Satan behind. You were, you know, beautiful. Until sin was found in you. And what was the sin? I will make myself like the most high. Really? Now why would he want to do that? Think about it if you're ambitious. If you're against somebody else and you want to beat them, what are you thinking to yourself? I want to be higher. I want the status. I want to win. You know, kind of like Donald Trump. I want to win. I want to beat everybody else. I want to prove I'm better. What other motive could there be? I I don't have a need to prove I'm better than you. Ideally, you don't have a need to prove you're better than me. It doesn't matter who's better. And if you're better than me, I'm happy for you. It's not a threat. I get God, so I really don't care about anything else. Well, but Satan had God... Before he was called Satan, Satan means adversary, adversary attorney, technically. Okay, the guy who's on the other side of a court trial, 
who's, you know, representing his own clients. Right? That's what Satan means. Ha Shatan. Satan. You could say Shatan. In Arabic, it's Shaitan. Okay? Now, Satan could use that because he wanted to beat God. Why would he want to beat God? Because he wasn't happy with him. For whatever reason, and you find out what the reasons are as you go through the text, for whatever reason, he he just got, you know, real disgruntled with God. That's kind of what this whole audio series is about. From the very beginning, it's to explain the underpinning of the trial between God and Satan. Okay. What, what, what could possibly upset him? Well, for whatever it was, God didn't live up to Satan's standards. Satan thinks he's better than God. He's ticked off about whatever that is. And he wants to beat God and prove he's right over God. He wants to beat God. That means he values a status of being a winner or on top. More than he values his relationship with God. You see that? Now we all get into stuff like that. If you're happy in your job, you don't care about your status. You're just busy being happy about the content. The content of your job makes you content. Your content makes you content. If you like the house you live in, your spouse, your kids, the content of your life with them makes you content. Well, apparently, Satan didn't like the content of his life, and he was not content with it. Well, that's when you start battling. That's when you start playing games with your status versus somebody else's status. Why? Because the status question helps you justify to yourself the battle. Well, you shouldn't be rich, and, and we should tax the rich, and, and... Really, what you want is them to give it to you. We should tax the rich, because, they, they, you know, they're, they're evil. What it really is, is you're jealous that you're not rich like them, and you want them to get a lower status. Because to you, rich is a higher status. And you want it taken away. Because you don't like them having a higher status than you. That's pretty petty. That's what Satan's doing here. Okay, so that's the battle. So look at it. Look at what, what went on there. With Satan. I was really going to start this in a different place. But I'm going to start with Satan, I guess, because I've already been doing it. Okay. Satan had the highest level of status that any creature ever had. He was the anointed cherub. He was Hillel ben Shakar. He was morning star. It's really important to know that was Satan's title. Because Jesus Christ, as humanity, wins it instead when Satan lost it. He was the highest creature in God's kingdom before man was created. Like it says, well, it's either in Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28, I forget which, but it says, You walked amongst the stones of fire. That was a title for the angels. Stones, you know, like, that's the same kind of title that we all get. You know, chips off the old block of Christ. The whole idea of gemstones. Satan walked around among the stones of fire. In other words, he was the leader. He was the guardian of the throne. Nobody was higher than him. So he already had top status. From the get-go. So why would he suddenly become discontent with that? Discontent with the content of what he had. That's the irony of this. Okay? He already had the highest status there is. Jesus Christ was 
you know, son of God at that point. And that's his own elected title. You know, he chose to be son, call himself son. But there's no humanity. He doesn't have a body. He's a visible member of the Godhead. And in those days, you know, he, he displayed himself in, in some kind of angelic form. Who knows? So why would Satan be jealous of that? Why wouldn't he be thinking, wow, I'm number one in the kingdom next to the Most High. I don't know about you, but I, I would find that actually intimidating. But Satan, Satan, you know, is upset about it. Or maybe he really did find it intimidating. And he had to tell himself that he's actually better because he felt so inferior and insecure every time he kept on looking at the Son of God, the Most High is what the angels call him. They have their own name for him. They call him the Most High. Imagine every day you're number one next to the Godhead. And every day, all day, and every night, all night, although there's probably no such thing as night in those days, you're around him. You're the liaison between the God that everybody sees, because they don't see Father, and they don't see Spirit, and the rest of creation, which at that time was only the angels and whatever animals they used. On the planets, whatever planets there were. That's a really heady office vis-a-vis -vis the rest of creation. But how can you not be feeling small and puny when you look at God? You know, we're so small. We're almost like dead to the extreme difference between God and us. We're so small in our understanding that we can we can almost not relate to it at all. The bigger you are, the more you mature in Christ, the more you realize what a putz you are, and the more you can't stand yourself. That's one of the hazards of maturing, even in humans. The more you mature, the more you realize how little you know. When you're in your 20s, you think you know everything. That's because your knowledge is small. <laughs> So you think that, you know, everything you know is everything there is. The more you mature, the more you realize how you know nothing. Yeah, and the bigger you are as a being, the more you recognize how much higher infinite God is. So maybe Satan was like stretched. I'm trying to sort of build um, a case for empathy for Satan here. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to understand this. You know, everybody's demonized him so much. They don't understand what really happened in there. He is number one guy. And the next guy above him is God himself. But everybody else is so far below him. He's like God to them. This is what God's training us for. Because we're going to have our own kingdoms. And just above us is going to be some other king likely. But, you know, higher, 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 hierarchy of kings. There's going to be some, there's going to be Christ, and then just under him, there's going to be X number of kings. You know, people mistake it. They think that, you know, the 24 seraphim in Revelation 4 are really, you know, Christians. No. But, there will be some just below him hierarchy. It might be only Paul. It might be Paul and the Apostles. I don't know. But that top tier? How intimidating is that? So for Satan, it was a unique situation. He's got to figure out how to go on living with the extreme excruciating differential between what he is versus the Most High. And the extreme excruciating differential between him as he is and those below. That's the same battle. 
that Christ will end up going through in his humanity and that is stated directly in Hebrews 2 which was led into by Hebrews 1. Use 1 John 1 9, just read it in English, it's decent enough, it's mistranslated in places but not so much that you're going to miss the point. Use 1 John 1 9 while you read it, talk to God. It's not too hard to understand. Christ was made lower than angels for that reason. The stretch would be worse than the stretch that Satan had to go through. And the you know, text talks about it. He was, he was not made an angel like Satan, okay? He was made lower, which means it would be harder. And he's God. So if the stretch for Satan not being God, between God above him and creation below him was hard, then Christ being God-man, I don't know how he survived five seconds. You see the point? And yet we are body of Christ and we have sin natures and we're supposed to have God's thinking running in us 24-7, which of course never happens. But the more it does happen, the more it's like being on the rack. You know, the rack, the medieval punishment. The, the medieval punishment of the rack was, you know, you've probably seen it in movies, but lay yourself on the ground and spread your legs apart and then spread your arms above you so that your body basically forms a, a wide-angled X. So your legs are very far spread apart and your arms are very far, far spread apart. That was the basic body position for the rack. And then they tied your wrists and they tied your legs to horses or to some machine. And then they would crank it or walk the horses farther and farther apart until your your legs were pulled off from the trunk of your body and the arms were pulled off from the trunk of your body. That was called the rack. It was a medieval torture device or a medieval punishment that was used with horses. That's what it was like for him to be God-man because the two natures are so different. He's being pulled apart all the time. My pastor spent a lot of time talking about that when he was trying to cover the book of Hebrews, especially to cover the nature of God-man um, when he was talking about the first use of hypostasis in, I think it's if you, uh, Hebrews 1, 2 or 1, 3. He's the exact stamp, the exact nature of God. And at the same time, human. The more you get God's thinking in you, the more, the harder it is to live. The battle of that, of just being. Okay, now what I tried to, you know, upgrade that in the last increment was, the irony is that that gives you the highest status. He had the highest status as God-man. Satan had the highest status. As the number one guy in the, you know, in the angelic kingdom before there was even humanity. See the parallels? And now we got the highest status as body of Christ. Every single day and every moment of every day, Satan has, before he was called Satan, when he was called Chelel ben Shachar, he has to live with that. He has to live with looking at Jesus Christ all the time in his angelic manifestation, whatever it was. And know how much more inferior he was compared to the Most High. And at the same time, he's looking down on creation. And he's supposed to be their liaison. How can he stand it? So you see, God is empathetic to Satan. This whole thing is playing out because Satan couldn't take it. He said, you know, I, I'm going to make I, I'm going to make myself like the Most High. Why? Because he can't live with the differential. He has to tell himself that something's wrong with God in order to cope with the, the stretch. 
in the name of the creation below him, who he was very proud. Because remember, the Bible says it was pride. I'm, I'm their, I'm like their God, but he's your God. How do you live with that? Well, something's got to be wrong. Because the dichotomy is too great. Okay, so this explains why Christ took on a lower life form. And not only did that, but worse, paid for the lower life form's sins. Satan never had to do that. Satan was supposed to rule creation. He didn't have to pay for their sins. There weren't any sins. But he had to pay. Christ ended up paying. And of course, not just for humans. Because, you know, sin is sin is sin. Doesn't matter who does it. Okay, what about all the angel sins? Duh. Christ had to pay for them on the cross, too. And because he's lower, the, you know, the leverage, the differential, the pain, the suffering would be, you know, hello. If a human being and God together, well, the angel's in the middle. So then he can pay for angel sins too. But who can who can guess at the pain? Satan never had to do that. So then it's fair, get this, it's fair, Psalm 110, 1 and following, and then all the other verses, for Jesus Christ and his humanity to w win the title of Morning Star. That Satan obviously forfeited when he rejected. When he said, I'll make myself like the Most High. Okay, well, we'll give the Most High a lower status human. And if he goes and wins at the cross, Psalm 110, then he beats the former Morning Star and wins the title instead. It's a real important doctrine. And I feel very sorry for the people who insist that Satan's title was not Morning Star. They're missing the point. Hopefully you're getting it. And of course, you know, use one John 1, 9. Talk to God. Look in the verses. Because I've given you the places where you can find them. Verify it yourself. This isn't a hard doctrine. It's not rocket science to learn this stuff. Unfortunately, the pulpits won't cover it. They're too busy pontificating on whether or not you sleep with your wife or some other woman and who you should vote for in the presidential election instead of teaching you Bible. Now, I learned all this under my pastor. I see it now in Bible for myself. I didn't used to know it from the Bible for myself. Now I do, but hello, that means it's out there. There are pastors teaching this. It is in the Bible. You can see it for yourself. So go do that. Because now you'll understand the point. Satan wanted to be, what? Highest status. He had that. He rejected it. And now to him, this is why he hasn't given up after millions of years. Millions, billions, who knows how long. Because, you know, angelic creation is a lot older than the earth. Alright, so, hello, Satan rebelled. And he lives for the day when he can be God. And God's already told him, look, I'm not going to try and gerrymander the future. I'm not gerrymandering the facts. But I already know what's going to happen. And here it is. And I even wrote it in a book for the mere humans. And how come you ain't listening? So we're all a testimony to Satan. You're not. It ain't going to work. God's busy showing Satan through us. It's real important to see this. God's busy showing Satan through us. Why all of his goals and ideas and plans, A, won't work, B, aren't better. And that should be just kind of obvious. Hi, is it more fun to stand in front of a mirror all day and tell yourself how good you are, like Donald Trump is trying to do? Or is it more enjoyable to look up at God and just flat enjoy him? 
And of course, the problem that you have when you're getting ready to do that and you're growing and doing that, it's all enjoyable at first, kind of like a honeymoon. And then at some point you wake up and say, oh, I am so inferior to you. And then it becomes painful to look at him. Because your own inferiority is staring you back in the face. Why? Because you've been deflected into looking at the mirror of your inferior status. There's no, there's no fixing that. Yeah, of course you're inferior. But the point is, so what? God's not making an issue of it. But like Satan, you are. I am. We all do. It's a natural part of growing up. There's some point, even with your parents, when you're really young, it's you you don't you think about yourself and you're really self centered. But at the same time, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy. Okay? And then as you get a little older, a little older, a little older, you become less self centered and more enjoyment in looking at mommy and looking at daddy and looking at oh look at this this combine at the Smithsonian and oh we went to the Air and Space Museum and oh I got to see I got to see a plane and you're busy thinking about those things. You're not thinking about yourself. So you start to enjoy life. But then you get a little more older and a little more older and in your teens. It's a freaking nightmare. Who are you versus your parents? You need to be somebody other than your parents. So you think you need to rebel against your parents. And I'm betting that's what happened to Satan. Because somewhere he was like adolescent. Their version of adolescence. And he couldn't, he couldn't cross over. Or he got into young adulthood. Because a lot of the people, you know, you see them around, especially today, in their early 20s, and sometimes even in their early 30s, they're, they're, they're really emotionally immature. They're always having to fight you. They can't just, I don't know, they, they can't sit back. Okay? They're stuck. Satan got stuck somewhere. And in the spiritual life, it happens. You get stuck. You just... Because you're aware that God is so much better. And now, you know, part of you is in love with Him, of course. And so you want to be better because He's so gorgeous. And you want to do something for Him. But everything you do is really bullshit. And you can't take it anymore. And you don't want to admit it. And so then you tell yourself, Oh, well, I'm doing good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. You know, like Donald Trump keeps saying, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Me, 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 me. That's a sign of insecurity. That's a sign of lack of maturity. And it's not to condemn it. It means the person's stuck. And we all go through that on any given moment, no matter how mature you are. And as a whole stage, and pretty much most Christians, 99% of them, they never get beyond that. I'm not even sure most of them were out of childhood, let alone even adolescent. But early early adulthood, they tank. They have to get religious or they have to become atheists. It's one of the two. And it all reflects Satan's original sin. I will make myself like the Most High. And as a way to like combat his discomfort, extreme discomfort, in being the liaison between God and creation. Now, you can prove that also, because the story is all the way through the Bible, but you can prove that also in the way he tempted the woman in Genesis 3, the very beginning of it. What is he tempting her? So you say, oh, he's tempting her to eat the apple. Well, it wasn't an apple. But it was a piece of fruit on the tree that God said, don't eat from that tree. In Genesis 2.17. Satan's argument to her 
to justify her picking that fruit and eating it. Because it was only the eating that was a sin. Day you eat from it, you'll die, die and you will die. Mot, da, mot. Okay. His argument to her was that if she ate it, she would become as smart as God. That he was withholding knowledge from her and somehow magically in that fruit, the missing knowledge she would gain if she ate that fruit. I don't know how stupid you can be to believe that. I'm not sure she even did believe it. I am sure that she wanted to find some way where she could rebel against God. So what does that tell you? That she's got the same motives as Satan. She's uncomfortable. She's under God and she's under Adam. So she's lowest on the totem pole. Obviously status mattered to her. She was not content with the content of her relationship with God. She was not content with the content of her relationship with Adam. And the rest of us have pretty been pretty much been repeating her sin ever since. You know, when God makes your soul at birth, and that doctrine begins in Genesis two seven Someday, if I live long enough, I'll have time to post all the verses and show it to you. When God makes your soul at birth, it's perfect. Your body has a sin nature in it. That's Romans 5.12, the aorist tense of hamartano in the Greek. All sin when Adam sinned. The word when is inserted in English to convey the aorist tense of hamartano. Okay. So the sin nature is in your body. Original sin is actually committed by each one of us the first time we sin. Because the soul, when it's imputed to the exited outside the body, outside the mother, fetus, it's now outside. It's up to God. Okay, yes, I want to turn this fetus into a real human. Or no, I don't. If the answer is yes, the baby cries and God breathes into his nostrils just like Adam. Okay? And then the baby exhales and now it's a living soul just like Adam. Okay. At that moment, the soul's perfect. But very quickly after that, the baby will do something that's a sin. It won't know it's a sin. But it will be. Sin is sin is sin. Knowing it, not knowing it, it's still a sin. Red is red. Red doesn't know that it's red. Blue doesn't know that it's blue. It's still blue. It's still red. Then the baby's sin nature enters the soul. Having been only in the body. Christ died for all sins, so it doesn't matter. The baby dies, it goes to heaven because it couldn't have refused the gospel. You only go to hell for refusing the gospel. Okay, hopefully you know that from John three sixteen through what was it? Three thirty six. You can't go to hell for any other reason. What was that? Concerning sin because they don't believe in me, John sixteen nine. And he's hitting me with stuff while I talk. And I'm not sure I'm repeating everything I'm hearing. I'm feeling very nervous right now. Anyway, that's my arrogance, Dad. I just caused me to say this right. The point is, is that the woman reflects Satan's own sin. For the same reasons. She's obviously insecure. She obviously is upset about status. You're not upset about status if you're not content. You're not upset about status if you are content with the content of your life. Think about it. There's no way you're going to want to sin if you're content. So every time you sin, it's because you're discontent. A baby is going to quickly become discontent. It doesn't know any Bible doctrine to counter the sin nature. 
This in nature is going to bing, 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 bing like the Energizer Bunny. It's going to give in. The baby's going to give in. And then the discontent now, which had been in the body only, is now inside the soul. Okay? Which is kind of a good thing. Because now the child is condemned. In the same way Adam was when he first sinned. The same way the woman was when she first sinned. So now the baby goes to heaven. And you can say, well, what if the baby died before he sinned? That's not even possible. How do you know that? Because the baby cries. Because the baby gets upset. Because of all kinds of things babies do that you wouldn't do if you were older and smarter. If you had sense, you wouldn't act like a baby, now would you? You say, well that's not fair. Sin is sin is sin. It doesn't matter if you couldn't help it. And actually you could help it, but you don't have the knowledge to help it. So you didn't do it. See the brilliance of God in that? If it's born and it dies, even, I don't know, a nanosecond afterwards, but it cried, it was alive at birth, even for I don't know how many seconds. It was really alive at birth. Now, how do you know it's alive at birth? It's breathing on its own. Nostrils have to be unplugged. That's what happens in the you know, delivery room. First thing the nurse does is unplug the nostrils and cut the umbilical cord. First thing. If it's breathing on its own, that's how the Bible defines it. Na Shema, breathing on its own. Life is defined as breathing. If it's not breathing, it's not alive. Okay, well, it's not breathing inside the womb. It's not possible. Because the nostrils are plugged. The mouth is covered. It can't be breathing oxygen outside in the air because it's not outside in the air. It has to be independently breathing on its own. That's the Bible's definition of life. So there's no life in the womb. Period. I can't even tell you how many verses have that in there. Na Shema, Shema. I mean, I, I have to go search it. The Hebrew term means breathing. If it's not breathing, it's not alive. How many verses are there in the Bible with that term in it? I don't know. 200? 400? Probably 200. You see the point? So you have to be spiritually breathing. And how can a baby be spiritually breathing? It has no... It has a brain, but the brain isn't even finished. When it's born, the skull doesn't even harden for like a year. So now go back to the woman. She sins. Because she's insecure. Because she's being childish. Because she feels intimidated. Because she feels inferior. Because she is inferior. Satan played on that. Because that's his own sin. So now come back to us. The more you learn about God, the more you find out how inferior you are. The more you, therefore, stop thinking about how great you are and all the rest of it. But at the same time, there's a pressure to call yourself great. And when you finally get past that hurdle, because you're too busy looking at God, then he reinserts it. Hi. Yeah, you're looking at me and that's where you need to be. But hi, just like Christ had to remember every single day of his life that he's Messiah, you have to remember every single day of your life that you're royal family of God. Now people, not a whole lot, but enough pastors have taught that. We're all supposed to be Christ-like. We're all sons of God in Christ Jesus. We all know that. What was that? It should be in Galatians 3. It's in more, more places than that. But we're sons of God in Christ Jesus. 
My pastor would like to call it Royal Family of God. He gets that from James, Royal Law, and other places. Um, what was that? Revelation 1, 6 and 5, 10. And Peter. Second Peter. Second Peter or First Peter 2, 5 and 9. A holy nation. Should be First Peter 2, 5 and 9. Okay. So, your royal family of God. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure you would consider it important and you could relate to the trouble or the hassle or the difficulty. Imagine you woke up every day and you were Prince William. Or one of those royal family princes or princesses. That wouldn't be too easy to live with. You can't do what a commoner can do. And every single day you're drilled in all these things the commoners never have to think about. Endless procedures, endless customs, this and that and the other thing. You can't even go out and buy a pack of gum. Well, welcome to the royal family of God. See, you're important. Every day you wake up, I'm royal family of God. Everything depends on me. And that's what I'd said before. Now we're focusing on the irony of that, which was the end point in the last increment. The irony of that is that that was Satan's situation. We are replaying Satan's situation before his fall. We are replaying the woman's situation before her fall. We are replaying Adam's situation before his fall. And we're already fallen. So, technically, it shouldn't even be possible that we would want God. Because we already got the sin nature in our bodies. The you know, within seconds after we're born, it's now in our souls. The whole world is against learning and living on Bible. It likes to mouth the Bible, but not actually learn it. How is it that anybody at all wants to learn God? Much more, how is it ever going to be possible that we think like Christ? It shouldn't have even been possible for Christ to be Christ. And it almost didn't happen. Eight people. Noah, his wife, his three kids, and their wives. That's all. Everybody else rejected God. That's how close it came. The angels... You know, turned themselves into human bodies. You know, the fallen angels cohabited with everybody so there wouldn't be any pure human DNA. And they almost made it. Failing that, well, then after Noah and his sodomy and all the rest of the stuff he got into, somehow, you know, you ended up having Abraham. And he was no, you know, sterling, moral character. He lied about his wife over and over again. Even after God promised him. Even after she was pregnant. Go look at it. Once it's in Genesis 18. He lied to Abimelech. And Sarah was already pregnant with Isaac. He lied to Abimelech. I think that was when, that's where it is. Because Genesis 16 is Hagar. That's when, you know, Abraham was only, what, 83. But this was after Genesis 17. And I think that was the passage. Or Genesis 17, 17, 18, something in there. Go look at it. The point is that Abraham kept lying about his wife because she was so pretty. Even when she was 90 years old. So what was this? 
Well, it sure the heck didn't matter if Abraham was moral or a good boy. Abraham believed in the Lord and was credited to his account as righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. That's all you could say that was good for him. And he was a finagler, a manipulator. Now, what's the point of all this? The point is that are you, well, Paul. Paul was the worst sinner who ever lived by his own confession. What was that? First Timothy, First Timothy one. Uh, first, what was that? First Corinthians fifteen. And in Galatians, um, probably at the beginning. Yeah, because he was he was talking about how he was the least of the apostles, and he confronted Peter and all that other stuff. Now. What does that tell you? If Paul was the worst sinner who ever lived, then that's not you. Are you Paul? No. Okay, then you're not the worst sinner who ever lived. If you're a royal family of God, it didn't depend on whether you sinned or not. Just like it didn't depend when Abraham did the stuff that he did, God gave him what? All the families of the world will be blessed through you didn't matter that he lied about his wife didn't matter that he fornicated with his wife's maid because his wife wanted him to God said no his wife said yes just like Adam listened to his wife instead of God so did Abraham did that tell you anything so then your being royal family of God is not as bad as what Abraham did your being royal family of God is not related to how bad you are. Paul is worse than you. So then you can be better. So then now let's go back to Satan. Everything Satan ever wanted, which was to win, right? Who wanted that more? Satan wanted to win. Who put him in the place where he could win? God. Isaiah 45, 7. I created the evil one. God knew full well the day, as it were, that he created Satan along with all the rest of the angels. All that once, Genesis 1, 1. He knew. Didn't stop him. He's taking responsibility for Satan saying no. He's also making it real clear to Satan and the rest of us. Hi, I wanted Satan to be highest. I created him that way. I put you there. That's also in, I think it's Ezekiel 28, but it might be Isaiah 14. I put you there. I put you there. I, God, put you, Satan, there. Well, he did. So then he must have wanted Satan to be highest didn't matter that he foreknew what Satan would do. didn't matter that he foreknew what the woman would do. didn't matter that he foreknew what Adam would do. didn't matter that he foreknew what Abraham would do. didn't matter that he foreknew what Paul would do. And it doesn't matter that he foreknows what we will do. He wanted us to have the status. Now, the old nature craves status. We're constantly being bombarded with Satan's original sin, which became the woman's original sin, which has been in everybody ever since. Me be good, me be good, me be good, me be God, 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 like the Energizer Bunny. And all of the Christians and all of the Jews are constantly running around this planet trying to do good and trying to do God. And telling themselves that they're succeeding. Just like Satan. And the irony is that here we are already being granted a higher role than we even understand.
just like Satan. Who Christ took over and built higher going to the cross and higher than the previous covenant we get now in him the theme of the book of Hebrews better things have come Hebrews eleven thirty nine through 40 er, attic word there is Kryton K-R-E-I-T-T-O-N but the O looks like a W better things is how you translate it we get that in him because he won over Satan at the cross and all of this is to teach Satan, hello, look what you're missing, and you can still have it. Just say, I'll buy. I believe in Christ now. But he won't. Don't you think God would take him back? How is that a loss to God or anybody? How is that unfair? Where is God benefiting from seeing anybody burn in hell? And all those who don't believe that hell is real will tell you that's not going to benefit God. Of course it won't benefit God. But if there is no hell forever, then those people have no ability to turn around and say, Hey, I blew it. I believe in Christ now. Because he did pay for everybody, including all the angels. So they do not have to stay there forever. But if God cut them off and obliterated their souls, then God is terminating their freedom to change their minds. That's the advertisement to Satan and all the angels that all of us are. Because we're choosing what they would not. In spite of the fact that we're low, stupid barely above animals you get that now you look at yourself in the mirror or in your status in life and there's going to be plenty where you can say wow I'm just so low I feel so bad or maybe you have a high status but you know sometimes having a high status is actually more insulting because here you have all this money and power and fame and whatever else the world holds dear and you can't do squat with it. You've had the cars, you've had the furs, you've had the connections, you've had the thousand dollar or ten thousand dollar plate dinners. Everybody shakes your hand and says how wonderful you are and then you go home at night and get into bed and it's like, is this all there is? Now you know how Satan felt. So what's the antidote to that? On the one hand, hi, you wanted the status? He gives you his son. Can it get higher than that? You wanted the status? Hi, Christ in you, the con thank you. Dad, what was that? Christ in you, the confidence of glory in where? Colossians 125 through 27. Body of Christ, equal to Christ, inheriting everything he is and has. What was that? Isaiah 53 12. Because he made himself equal to you. What was that? Isaiah 53 5. He was javelin stabbed with our sins. And therefore in exchange, what was that? Second Corinthians 5.21 We get his righteousness in exchange for our sins. So therefore we get the righteousness of Christ which is also, you know, Second Corinthians 5.21 Well, then you're equal to Christ. Yeah, that was a design. God should not have to put up with lesser than it's real. It's a status. He bought. He paid for it. God doesn't do sham transactions. Okay, but can you function at that level? Yeah, if you got enough Bible in you. No, if you don't. So that's why we need the kings in the eternal state. You're a king under the king of kings and all these other people running around the planet. They don't have that status. 
They could, but they don't want it. So what kind of pressure is that on each of us? I wake up in the morning, I'm a messiah. He's the messiah. I'm a messiah under the messiahs. And I'm being used to save the world. Salt of the earth concept. Or I'm being used to curse it. Because that's the flip side. Hundredfold yield, seed parable. The flip side of that is 99% of them ain't going to do it. 99% of the seeds ain't going to even sprout. Or 99% of the seeds will sprout, but as, it, as the seed parable is worded in the Luke wraparound to Matthew, they won't bring fruit to maturity. See, fruit bearing means you have to grow up to be a tree. And it's the third crop of a tree that in the Mosaic Law was eligible to be eaten. The first two you had to throw away. Leave it for the birds or the poor. You weren't allowed to harvest that until the third year. And then after that, you could harvest it. Third year onward. That's in the Mosaic Law. Okay, well, if they don't even grow to be a tree... And Christ is saying, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. What does that mean? 30-fold, 3 times 30 is 90. So just roughly saying, we'll say 3% Christians actually do any maturing. 60-fold is 1.5% of Christians doing any maturing. And 100-fold is 1%, meaning the rest don't. Well, go look at the politics today. Everybody picking some Caesar. Oh, he's going to save America. What about God saving America? Oh, nobody cares about God. God is something you mouth on Sundays to make yourself look good. Well, there's your 99%. But you're the 1%. And I'm the 1%. And oh boy, like my pastor liked to say, we're spiritual atlases. Learn and live on Bible. Use 1 John 1 9. Find out who's your right teacher. Be under your right teacher. Learn and live on Bible every day under your right teacher. And that's the maturation process. And God will spare your country because of you. Could you ask for more status than that? That's being the Most High. On behalf of instead of most high. See, Christ, Satan wants to beat Christ. Satan wants to be the most high instead of Christ. Greek word anti means instead of Christ. The people backing all of the, the main Republican candidates, Cruz and Tr Trump, Cruz and Trump, they're dominionists. They think that, oh, we want to be instead of Christ. That we have to make this a Christian nation. And then we can make Christ come back. I don't know if it's possible to be more apostate than that. That's what Satan wants. To be the kingmaker. And yet, the irony is... That God is giving to each of us union with Christ. So we're not instead of, but in. In Christ, you remember hearing that like all over the New Testament. One with him like he prayed in John 17 verses 20 and following. In? How, how do you get closer than in? That the two shall become one marriage. That they may be in us as we are in each other. Christ prayed in John 17. You want to talk about status? One with the Godhead? Even Satan didn't have that. So there's your irony and there's the battle of living every day knowing you've got this excruciating differential just like Satan had to live through between God high and you low 
And then people around you are even lower because they don't have as much Bible doctrine as you got. So every day is replaying the ancient pre-human battle of integration that Satan had to go through. The ancient battle of integration that Adam and the woman had to go through. The ancient battle of integration that Abraham had to go through. That especially Christ had to go through. And taking it to a whole new higher level. Hey, kind idea, thank you, the New Testament. And then, of course, Paul. And now us. Pretty heady stuff. Pretty big battle. And it sounds like it's really the battle, right? 